Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this Fort Collins Startup Week talk on taming technology, how to effectively navigate the many technology decisions of a startup. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about the different areas of your startup where you're going to need to be making some technology decisions and then really honing in your tool set for how to make strategic decisions, key questions you need to ask, and then ultimately some steps for evaluating different technologies as you're moving your startup forward. Um, I am Tim Clyer, and I've been in software for about 10 years. I've worked with small businesses and academic institutions, enterprises, and governments really all across the board. I'm also a, an entrepreneur as well as Ron. And uh, so it's from our personal experience that we're sharing and also in our consultancy for other companies that we're bringing this, um, these principles to you. Uh, one more note, uh, I'm, when I'm not doing software, I love to do things like build. This used to be a shed, which is now an office. We call it the Shoffice. Uh, I also love to run and spend time with my family. So Ron, over to you, can you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Ron Zazadinsky, and I run CodeGeek, which is a web design and development company that I started 19 years ago, and we've grown to 15 employees. Um, I've been involved with computer programming really throughout my entire life, and uh, in addition to the, the company I run now that I founded, I also have two other LLCs, and I've been a part of a few startups, so I have uh, some experience across a wide range of, of sizes of organizations. And uh, when I'm not running Code Geek, I, uh, I really enjoy flying airplanes and playing ice hockey. And my wife and I enjoy hiking and skiing. So we're very active uh, in the outdoors. Awesome. So getting to the why behind this presentation, uh, about three or four months ago, I was starting to think, what could I present at Startup Week that would be useful? And I thought about Ron and our recent communications. And I also thought about the intersection of decisions that you have to make in a startup and technology. We both have a technology background, but obviously in all of our endeavors, we're needing to make decisions. And in this digital age, there are more and more decisions that are based around technology. So we thought it would be useful to, to have a presentation based on our learning and really based on a lot of our, our weaknesses and failures probably, where we're bringing to you these insights uh, around how to make technology decisions. Ron, what was it for you? Why did you say yes to this opportunity and what was going through your head? Yeah, to me, uh, our goals here include helping you improve your thinking and planning, uh, helping you avoid surprises that occur by overlooking a factor you could have known about ahead of time. Those are learned from mistakes that, that I've made. Um, help you with expectations. As your company grows, the magnitude of your technology decisions increases. Uh, you may be able to shoot from the hip as a smaller company, but with more employees, having more structure and a more complete understanding before making the larger decisions helps. And often in life, happiness is impacted by expectations. When your expectations are too high, there can be disappointment. With realistic expectations, the chance of finding happiness and even delight is greater. Yeah, those are good insights. Thanks. So... As we dive in here, let's start with an example startup and go through some of the decisions that the technology decisions that a startup might need to make. So let's say that we want to start selling widget wedges. We want to sell widget wedges online. So we're going to build a website. Well, we need some branding. We have a company. We need a logo. We need some design and some colors. We also need a contact form if we want our customers, potential customers to reach us. And of course, that's going to be funneled into an email, likely. We also, if we want to sell these, we have to have some sort of an online checkout system. We need to have a payment processor. And then we need to somehow handle the shipping aspects if they're involved and refunds as well. Then you think about how do you bring people to your website? You're going to have to have some marketing engine. That might be social media. It often is nowadays. And that uh, produces really leads that we then want to have analytics on, what type of users came to our website. So the, the people that we're targeting, the, the customer segment we're targeting for our widget wedges 
are those indeed the people that are coming to our website? You're also gonna to need to consider operational concerns, like if we sell different types of wood wedges, different colors, then obviously you've got a concern of different projects related to the production, likely. And then you might have some partnerships and this could be various suppliers or it could be in terms of uh, as you're selling this in the marketplace, who are your partners in the, in the customer aspect of, it, of things. And then we can't forget HR. We need to get paid. We need to uh, have some recompense for that. That's not just uh, cash in the bank accounts so some form of benefits. And then obviously at the end of the year and during this season, we're needing to deal with taxes. So this uh, slide is maybe getting a little bit overwhelming and that's on purpose. It's on purpose to show you just how many different aspects of your business where you're, you're going to need to be making these technology decisions. A lot of these are going to involve online platforms, obviously email, different things like HR benefits. Uh, there's a lot of technology involved with this. And then you can add another layer to that, and that is the integration of each of these different tools. How do people get to your website? Where from? Um, and, and all the ins and outs of this web of relationships of these technology decisions that you're gonna to have to make. So as we begin, we need to think about some key questions. So for each of those, you know, if you, if you think back to the previous slide, all those different considerations in terms of these are inflection points, places where I need to make technology decisions, for each of them, think about these things. Who should make the decision and who will be using the technology? Those are two important questions. If they're different people, you need to make sure that you integrate the needs of, of both and the person making the decision should really understand the needs of, of the one using technology. What are the critical jobs, pains and gains that technology must solve? This is, this is really important. What jobs do you have to do? What pains do you have? And then what do you have to gain from this potential technology choice? When do you need this solution in place? Is it tomorrow? Is it next year? Do you have quite a bit of time or do, or do you need a solution rather quickly? Where in your business is this technology needed? Is it needed across a few different departments or a few different sort of segments of your business? Or is it something where you just need it in isolation? That's an important question to ask. Why must you make this change? All these questions need to get back to the why. If you don't know why, maybe you shouldn't even be making that decision or changing technologies. And the must is important. Not just why do you want to make this change, but what is so painful or what job do you really have to do that's driving you to the point where you've got to make a change? And lastly, how best do you implement this new technology? Do you build, buy, or borrow? And what sort of transition plan do you have for it? Let's zoom in a little bit on the build, buy, or borrow. So this is just a simple alliteration, right? That's easy for everyone to remember, but it helps to categorize or classify uh, places where we'd make these technology decisions. Do I want to build, which I would wanna build something that's central to my distinctive value offering, so I have ultimate control over it. Do I wanna buy something, and I'm buying something where the off-the-shelf product is fitting my needs or do I wanna borrow something where I'm only gonna need it once or twice? Uh, let me give you an example. So these here, these are called Magnetas. And this is one of my side businesses and my family helps me, helps me with this. So these are uh, little, you could almost call them witch wedges, right? So these are little pieces of jewelry that are 3D printed and these have magnets on them. And so you can interchange them, a fun little kid's toy. So the process of making this, um, we've got, we're using something called Tinkercad, which is an online 3D modeling software. We download the files to our 3D printer, we print them out and look what we have here. We obviously put on the magnets, we package it up all nicely. But if I consider this product, build by borrow. So let's, let's start with borrow. I'm really borrowing Tinkercad. Tinkercad is the 3D modeling software and I'm using their free version. If I wanted something that was really robust, which I don't need, I would buy it. But in this case, I can kind of borrow their free version. What did I buy? Well, I bought a 3D printer. I bought the filament, the, the plastic filament. I bought a, lunch, a lot of different things. 
that are going to allow me to ultimately, when we get over to build here, produce a product that I can customize in 20 minutes. So instead of having to send off uh, 3D designs to somewhere else and then they print it out and they ship it back to me and it takes two weeks, we can iterate on this and create new prototypes in 10 or 20 minutes. So this is an example where in our business, we're making these technology decisions, even if we lose tech, uh, use technology as a broader term uh, and not just software or an app that you use. And it's examples of how we might build, buy, or borrow. In the end, a decent grid for this is if you need high customization and high usage, you're going to want to build it on your own. If you need low customization or low usage, you can probably just borrow it. So Ron, would you talk to us about decision-making strategies around these technology decisions that we're facing? Absolutely. So when we're in the process and getting ready, getting ready to make a technology decision, uh, it's important to keep in mind the goal. So we would describe the goal as finding an effective solution that meets your critical needs and pain points for that area or areas of your business for a period of time, which is probably not forever. Um, so we'll talk about the evaluation steps next uh, as you're making this decision. And as we do that, it's helpful to have a practical example uh, as we go through the steps. So I'm gonna give a simple example from my company that we made a few years ago. And the pain point that we had at that point in time is that project managers and our company were a services company, right? So we design and develop websites and web applications. And we have a number of project managers and they use their own cell phones for client communications. And uh, the project managers really didn't want clients having their personal phone number. There's a lot of reasons for that. You can probably imagine most of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the pain point that we had and we wanted to do something. We wanted to make a change, implement some technology to solve this. So we'll use this as our example. On um, the next step, um, next slide, we have the first couple of steps in evaluating. So there's four steps altogether. And the first one is the exploration period where we're scouting out new solutions. So for my example, the, the items we were considering, the options we were considering included potentially getting an in-office phone system, right? With desk uh, phones on everybody's desk. Uh, that would allow when they call the client, the outgoing number would be on caller ID, our company number. Another option would be for the company to purchase a, a second cell phone, you know, purchase a cell phone for each project manager. They would then of course have two cell phones, one for the personal use, one for company use, but that could solve the problem. And then the third option we were looking at was a digital phone service solution. And as we explore these, kind of this is where you're talking about it. Maybe you're making a spreadsheet and comparing and contrasting the options. Uh, the digital option for digital phone service looked pretty interesting. And that's the one we really wanted to explore. So in that case, we narrowed it down actually to a single option and moved to the evaluation period. So that's where you want to evaluate, again, perhaps a couple of choices, in our case, just one, uh, and a sandbox. So a sandbox could mean, what it really means is you're not necessarily implementing this full time uh, in production per se. So for us, it was using a subset of our project managers to test it out, make sure that the service worked the way it was advertised to. Um, and the sandbox was a small number of the team as opposed to the whole team. And so you know, we, we, we paid for it, we bought it. Uh, it's a month to month thing tried it out, it actually worked the way we expected, which is really cool that when you program it, you, you put your company phone number into the system, uh, we can set up extensions. So when people call the company number, they can press some buttons to go to the right person. And that actually forwards the call to an individual cell phone. Um, but when we make a call outbound, it has an app that runs on your phone. And if you open the app first and dial through the app, the from number that shows up on the caller ID is our company number. So we tested it out, sure enough, it worked. And um, the result of the evaluation period is a decision like, yes, we're gonna do this. We're gonna implement this uh, company-wide. So the third uh, step here is very important to give a lot of thought to, because uh, this is the transition from whatever you're doing now to what you're going to be doing. And if we look at this uh, graph, 
some pretty useful information here as far as uh, expectations. So this is a graph of performance over time, and we're starting with our current performance on the left. And the goal is to get to some improved performance, however you define that, the desired performance on the right. And as humans, we're generally optimistic and our expectation probably looks something like the dashed line. Where we're gonna get some improvement right away and reach that desired level of performance in whatever time frame we're, we're guessing. Uh, the reality tends to be the solid line, which is once you start implementing a change, there's a dip in performance. Uh, and that comes from uh, letter A there, which is there's a lot of factors involved as you're making this transition that you wanna give thought to ahead of time. So for example, you'll need time and resources for all these things. Perhaps there's data migration. If you're moving from one software tool to another, you may need to migrate data from an old tool, tool to a new tool. There's probably training involved, right? In our example, it was simple training, um, but each project manager needed to be trained on how to use uh, this tool and how to make an outbound call. And there was some data setup of, you know, entering everybody's cell phone numbers and setting up extensions. It was very small in the grand scheme of things. Um, oversight, someone needs to be in charge of this integration and uh, helping people through any challenges that might arise. So once you factor all that in, there tends to be this dip of reduced performance for a while. And sometimes as the reality uh, rising line shows, it can take longer than you might expect to reach that desired level of performance. In the end, the outcome is that the team is using this new tool in your actual operations in the real world. So we're not quite done there. The fourth and final step is a repeating step that occurs periodically throughout the lifetime of this, this tool. Uh, and that's ongoing assessment, asking yourself and asking the team periodically in some ideally some you know, regular way where you're checking in with everyone who's using the tool, what's working well and what's not. And based on that, we may make some additional decisions. Um, one of my favorite uh, examples of this is in a totally different realm of, of the world here, which is the Apollo moon landing program. And I find it interesting. I'm just a fan of the Apollo program. And um, one factor I learned recently uh, that a lot of people may not have heard of is that with each of the landings, including the very first landing, when they first touched down, the mission was not a success. It was not considered actually a completed mission or a, a successful mission, a successful landing. Immediately after landing, there's a stay, no stay decision. So the astronauts do this themselves. They actually have a, a moon contact checklist that immediately upon touchdown, they run through to evaluate, is it safe to stay? Is the ship damaged in any way? Did we land in a strange orientation, maybe with one leg up on a, on a boulder and that could slip off? Is there any reason we should immediately abort and leave the surface of the moon literally within the first minute or two? And then at mission control, the mission controllers have their own set of checklists by looking at the data of the systems that they manage. And the flight director calls for a stay, no stay decision around the entire mission control room. And only when everyone's in agreement that we're gonna stay is the mission considered landed on the moon. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. The comparison for you, of course, is that you have a lot longer to evaluate the stay, no stay decision than a couple of minutes. Uh, you're gonna do this probably over a month and years. So if we move to this slide, um, this is the culmination of these four steps is the mental model of this process of evaluating new technologies. Uh, so we have all the steps here, including the outcomes. And during this assessment phase, the final phase, if you will, uh, there's several pieces to consider. Um, so we're gonna talk about pivot and persevere. And these ideas come from um, a wonderful book, The Lean Startup, which many of you may be familiar with. And in that book, Eric Ries talks about pivot and persevere in some very specific ways that are quite valuable. Uh, we've also added pause here. And what we're talking about is when we get to the assessment stage, perhaps there are some issues, but it's not so bad. We're just gonna keep going. We're gonna persevere. Uh, in this example, um, the persevere carries some benefit with it in that it's kind of the, the devil you know. There may be some issues, but we're not changing direction, which adds more instability. Uh, you may decide that it is time to pivot, that there's enough challenges, enough pain points at that point in the assessment phase that we need to pivot, go back to the exploration and start looking at other tools that might be more appropriate at this point in time. Um, or you might consider pausing, which is the item we've added, uh, which is just not making any decision at all at this point and kicking that can down the road just a little bit. 
So this loop is a, a good summary of those four steps. So there's a, a number of considerations that, that we've encountered along the way that we wanted to share. And so, uh, Tim, tell us a little bit about um, the number of tools we might wind up with. Are we going to find one tool to rule them all? <laughs> That's probably not the case, Ron. Uh, it, it really depends on what business you have, what are the different needs that you have in, um, you know, let's say, a, a small business that has a, an administrative focus you may be able to get really far with a Google suite, for example. So you could use email and Google sheets and currently we're using Google slides. So you can, um, you can leverage some of these tool sets to really do quite a bit for your business. But then um, as we talked about before, places where you need to build something or need it more customized, you probably want that tool to be dedicated for a specific purpose. So there's, there's really no formula for this. It's going to be, taking a look, you know, kind of surveying your business, what are the different needs you have? And if you can group things, uh, group tool sets together, that's great. Uh, and if you need them to be in isolation, that's fine too. Actually, that leads us into the next point, bundling or forking. Why don't you talk to us about that? Uh, you bet. And I'm going to start with forking uh, because we've experienced this recently at CodeGeek. So we use some project management software that's uh, very complex and very powerful. And um, we had hoped that it would achieve quite a few things. And after using it for about a year, uh, we're actually three years into that process now, but after the first year, we realized that it really wasn't going to solve a couple of the pain points that we had that we were hoping it would. And so we actually needed to add an additional software tool, separate tool altogether to meet that, that need. Um, and so that's forking. So you wind up sometimes having to pick multiple tools to solve the problem uh, at the current time. And then the opposite of that is really what we're hoping for, and generally speaking, is bundling. So when there's opportunities to consolidate the tools we're using now, obviously that leads to more efficiency. And so we also have, we have that going on, a desire to bundle. So for example, right now, um, within our project management communications at CodeGeek, we're using Function Point, we're using Trello, we're using Slack, and we use email. Uh, and so we definitely have a pain point of where do I find the communication that I need to find? So we are looking for opportunities to bundle and reduce the number of those uh, very important tools. Mm -hmm. um, and this, you know, the kind of the conclusion of that is that uh, a change is constant, right? We can often have a high expectation that, hey, this tool is going to solve everything and it's going to be great. True, but changes will be needed at some point mm -hmm. in the future. And it could be just that you've hit more pain points with your current tool. Could be that new tools have come onto the market that weren't available when you made your choices before, or you just weren't aware of that may actually solve your problem in a better way. So that leads into uh, some thoughts about the transition plan. Yeah, and I think that that's the, the transition plan is is really necessary. It's it's a critical piece of going from one technology implementation to another. And you talked about it quite a bit and that that dip can be, I've seen that dip be incredibly painful in terms of the time involved, but also in terms of the financial cost. So we're talking in a, in a startup context, but if you scale your business, um, I've seen some companies waste literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on a technology implementation that they, they decided to go after. And then for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And I, I think that the failure in that mostly had to do with finding all the different pieces, everything required, all the people, all the systems, and lining them up in such a way that this transition plan can actually, uh, this migration can actually happen and not just uh, get stopped in the middle. Um, and I did mention people in there. Why don't you talk to us about the human element of technology considerations here? Yes, the human element is always present and really important to plan for. Um, you know, we, we're, as, as technologists, we're always excited about a new technology and solving problems with technology. But of course, humans are going to be using the technology. And so, for example, just training, the training element is really important to take into account. You may need recurrent training with, uh, through the lifetime of a tool, a particularly complex tools to remind people how to use them effectively for your company. Uh, one example for us at CodeGeek is with timesheets and our time tracking, um, we've trained everyone and this has taken repeated training efforts over time because it's easy to forget. 
Um, but we have trained all of our employees to log their time and describe what they've done in the past tense, as if a client is reading that timesheet description in the future. That way, when it gets time to uh, for invoicing, our project managers help with the invoicing. And when they're reading the timesheets of all the developers who've worked on something, it's already written in the tense and in the format that will make sense to both them reading that, because that work happened in the past, and to clients. Um, but it takes a little bit of recurrent training to keep that efficient. The payoff for us, though, is that invoicing is so much faster now with everybody logging their time in this fashion. Uh, so there can be a big payoff when you're planning for the human element. And that also leads to a time element. Time is another very important factor, of course. So there's time up front at the beginning. Give yourself enough time to make the decision to evaluate the different options out there. And, and when you're doing that, keep in mind that we don't want to let perfection overpower good enough, right? Often good enough is just that. So that's what we're shooting for. But it still takes time to make that decision and evaluate different tools, test them out in a sandbox and perform the implementation. That's often, depending on the complexity of the tool, can be the longest uh, part of the process. Uh, and then another time factor is how long will this tool last? How long will it be relevant? Um, and Tim, I think you have a few thoughts on, on that specific topic. Yeah, this is something where if your if your business is rapidly scaling and uh, you you're going to need a new technology, but what what you don't want to do is to choose a technology that you're going to outgrow in a year. So that might be a, a decent time span for we need we need to be able to use a technology for a year or two years before having to transition to a new one. Uh, if you're pretty sure that it's not going to get you very far and you're growing rapidly then I would suggest maybe sticking with that first, your first uh, technology choice, and then just working through the pain for a while until you're big enough that you can implement this more robust solution that fits your longer term needs. And we also don't wanna forget about quality, longevity, maintenance, and long-term commitment. And what we're referring to here is if you implement a specific technology that is sourced somewhere else or maintained by a different company, you want to make sure that they've been doing it for a while so they know what they're doing, that they maintain it well, and that they have a long-term commitment to that technology. Because uh, there's, there's this kind of famous story of this JavaScript package, so this JavaScript code that a lot of different applications had installed. And I don't know if the, uh, if the maintainer was disgruntled or something, but he, he essentially uh, changed some of the code and it broke everyone's application all over the internet. And, and that's just a, a small... Actually, the code base was small, but a, with a really big impact uh, where it demonstrates how important quality is in terms of the technology choices that you make and, and how you leverage them. So wrapping up here, we talked about key questions in technology decision making. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Then we talked about the goal for each of those decisions is to find an effective solution that meet, meets your critical needs and pain points for that area of your business for a period of time. And we also covered some evaluation steps, some strategies for exploration, evaluation, integration, and assessment then of those technology choices. Well, thanks everyone for joining us in this presentation on taming technology, how to effectively navigate the many technology decisions of a startup. I'm Tim Clyer and my contact information is listed there. And Ron, it's been a pleasure co-presenting with you. Uh, one of the criteria that I looked for in a co-presenter was a hard to spell last name. So you fit the bill on that one, but I have a lot of respect for you and your work and it's been a, it's been a great joy doing this with you. Tim, thank you very much. Uh, the feeling is mutual and it really has been a pleasure uh, putting this talk together and presenting it with you as well. Well, thanks again, everyone for tuning in here. And we hope that we're able to engage you in with questions, any comments you have in the Fort Collins Startup Week platform. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the Startup Week presentations.